pleasure of having John Bruning as our speaker. Um, so John, uh, you probably saw his uh, bio. Uh, he got his PhD at, um, at Penn State. I'm sorry, uh, his bachelor's at Penn State and his master's and PhD at University of Illinois. Um, and then his work there was on electromagnetics, which is, I guess, physical optics. Um, and it set him on a career of uh, remarkable contributions. And uh, last night at, at dinner, we were reminiscing over uh, uh, Bell Labs. So John spent about 15 years at Bell Laboratories, where he did some really seminal work in uh, developing optical lithography. And it actually led to some very interesting career developments for him because uh, in working with the industry partners to um, achieve some of the things that were being done in lithography at the time, um, he was introduced to um, uh, people at the um, that had formed Tropel and, uh, and then ended up joining Pro Tropel. Uh, which Tropel was a um, startup out of, uh, uh, born out of the University of Rochester and uh, became CEO of Tropel and has just been the champion of some um, remarkable advances in the field and he's going to share some of those with us today. Um, I'm, I, I'm also going to mention that uh, John is a uh, member of the Board of Trustees of University of Rochester our, uh, our sister institution, and we were talking at lunch about uh, trying to find more ways where we can collaborate together, and I think we're, we're all looking forward to finding ways to do that. So without further ado, I want to uh, welcome John. So I guess this is, I'm live? I'm live. Okay, well, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Really appreciate uh, the support I've gotten from colleagues over the years at uh, both Bell Labs and the uh, uh, Optical Sciences Center. And uh, I thought what I'd do today is kind of walk you through uh, uh, how I went through some of the, or took advantage of some of the opportunities that I had uh, in my career. And <clears throat> Let's see, I guess I need the, where's the, oh, here's my clicker. Hey, great. So what I'll do is, uh, this, this is uh, just a brief outline. I'd like to kind of give you uh, a tour of the, kind of the path of connections both to Tropel and its history and uh, some of the opportunities that uh, I was fortunate enough to be presented with and took advantage of. And along the way, talk a bit about the impact of the laser, microelectronics and microlithography, uh, and the interrelationship between these things, the important role of phase measuring interferometry in many of these things here. And <clears throat> later in the talk, draw some contrast to the incredibly different world that we're living in right now. And uh, there's some really old hardware you'll see in this process, and it's hard to believe I'm as old as some of those pieces of hardware, but in any event, it's, uh, it's a pretty exciting story, and I'm pleased to be able to share it with you. So if we talk about interferometry, I don't, these are basically photos of transparencies of fringes, of uh, coming out of an interferometer, looking at it, flats, lenses, whatever. But this was at a time when you had a transparency, and it was important to, in analyzing the optic that you were had in the interferometer to convert the bend of the fringes, the spacing between them, to the quality of the optic that you were trying to make. And this was all done with things like microdensitometers, rulers, pencil and paper. And uh, in addition to this, you had other pieces of optics that are in the pathway that somehow clouded the results that you're really trying to get. But <clears throat> phase measuring interferometry, the impact of low-cost computing, and the... Uh, uh, the concepts of metrology made a really, really huge difference. So before the laser came around, most of the sources were 
either mercury sources, emission sources, sometimes white light sources. And in order to analyze these fringes, you had, as I mentioned, a number of different uh, concepts to deal with. You want to fit um, Zernike polynomials eventually, remove alignment errors, and a lot of these difficult things involve tremendous turnaround time in, <clears throat> in, the, in the concept of actually getting to the information that you want. And all, there was uh, optical shops in these days were loaded with artisans which had uh, magic fingers and hands and could do wonderful things, but they really didn't like new stuff like computers and things of that sort coming into the, into the shop. But eventually it made their work so much easier. Well, Tropel <coughs> uh, was founded in 1953. It was a spin out of the Institute of Optics in 1953. And Bob Hopkins, who uh, is quite a famous name in the, in the field, along with Jack Evans and Jim Anderson, they formed Tropel. And Bob Hopkins was the optical. Uh, he was a, he got his degree, master's and PhD at the Institute of Optics. He was a faculty member from 1943 to 2000. And Jack Evans, he was more the mechanical guy. He was also a, a, uh, a graduate of the Institute of Optics and a uh, faculty member. And Jim Anderson, he ran a little division of <clears throat> Tropel that did some very interesting work on uh, micro optics that we'll talk about uh, a little bit later. But in any event, the company was founded based on its abilities to, first of all, hire the best students that were in the, in the institute at the time and funnel them over to Tr Tropel. And it was a fabulous staff and very talented opticians, as well as uh, really good corporate culture. So they were focused on basically high impact problems in optics, electronics, and mechanics, generally of a level that were not of interest economically or because of a significant business risk or a especially difficult technological risk. They, uh, they liked these problems. And they were almost in between the area of research and industry. And the company had basically thrived on this kind of uh, business model for quite some number of years. So th this is just sort of a pictorial logo history of the company. Founded in 53. In 1972, it was purchased by Coherent because of a particular product that was developed there in the early 70s. I'll say a little bit more about that later. In 1982, because of microlithography and the lens capability that Tropel had in making lenses for microlithography, the GCA company came along. They were a supplier and manufacturer of semiconductor equipment. And then uh, in 88, General Signal, which was a large conglomerate, um, this was at 1988 was about the peak, one of the peaks of the many cycles in the semiconductor industry. And it was a very trendy thing to be in microelectronics uh, during this period of time. They bought into this um, concept by purchasing Tropel at the peak of one of the cycles and followed it all the way down to the bottom when they decided this is, this is enough. Uh, we want out of this business. And that presented an opportunity for uh, myself and a couple of partners to take the company private in 94. And then we were private for about a little over seven years. And Corning, whom we had very close relationships with as a glass supplier and a uh, high-tech company, uh, that formed a relationship that is still in place today. So these are 
I'll just whip through a number of these products. This is what the products looked like in the early 60s. Most of the revenue was a result of selling these, these slides, which were very precise slides, but really quite inexpensive. And they were used in many, many different products, many of which were used for um, uh, military type instrumentation, um, and just a wide variety of OEM applications. That company was Velmax. And that was, uh, they left in 67, and this business is still in, uh, still, still a viable business today, still selling products pretty much like this. So getting into interferometers, this was Tropel's first commercial interferometer in the 1960s. Granite block, the laser wasn't really prolific at this time. And uh, it was here we had a Twyman green. You could, had, you could adjust the path length to match the source of, uh, that was appropriate. And you could see very modest price, but it was a lot of money in today's dollars. This was a real money maker for the company in the early 70s. These were autocollimators that were very, very um, important, especially with the advent of the laser. These were, I would say, eighth to tenth wave uh, collimators of all different apertures. And Tropel also developed a stabilized, affordable single frequency laser this, was, this sold for about $1,000 at the time when um, Hewlett Packard was selling a single frequency laser that was 10 times the price. This was the kind of the next generation where uh, the laser source fit within a, a nice cast iron base. This was an interferometer that was used in the optical shop in the early days uh, when you didn't have the appropriate test glasses to make the radius elements that, uh, that might be required. This was another product that was developed called the OTF system. This was a scanning knife edge system that um, <clears throat> in the, I would say, the mid 80s, this product line was sold to Opticos, who uh, has modernized this in several different formats and is still selling the product today. This product is called the Dioptron, which was a scanning sine wave target that was imaged on the back of the retina. And the, you could see by scanning the different, uh, the full frequency range, you could look at both, you could detect both astigmatism and uh, image acuity of the eye that you were looking through. This was of great interest to uh, Coherence, uh, not their company that formed the, um, basically the optical, uh, ophthalmic division of Corning, of uh, Coherent. And this, uh, this was developed by Charles Munnerlin, who headed R&D at the time, and because of this product, uh, this was really quite successful. It, uh, Charles Munderlin and Terry Clapham, both who developed this product, after this was successful at, Cor at uh, Coherent, they left to form Visix, which uh, was sold to Abbott Labs in 2005, I think, for about $2 billion. <coughs> So Jim Anderson run this, ran this little group called Special Products, and they developed concealment devices for the CIA. This is one example. This was in the late 70s. This, uh, a camera f fit right into, the, right into the standard barrel of a, of a pen, and uh, they worked together with Kodak in developing special film that would also fit into this camera. This is, uh, <clears throat> this can be seen at the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., along with some other concealment approaches. 
This is a little battery pack that had three canisters of film that they uh, uh, that could be uh, sort of conspicuously displayed without uh, suspicion. But this was uh, <clears throat> when GCA came into the picture in the mid 80s. Uh, they were quite upset by the fact that. Uh, the management was not allowed to see what was going on in this division. So the simplest solution of all, these, the, since most of the equipment was actually owned by the government, uh, this division of the company just went, uh, went private and is still in operation today. But there is no reason to build this kind of um, concealment camera because what you have in your cell phone today is considerably more, um, has considerably more power. And the price for an OEM camera like in your cell phone is around a, a dollar and a half today. These sold for several thousand dollars a piece to the government. And they worked very, very hard to find a second source that was cheaper and nobody would sign up for it and nobody could do it. So <laughs> interesting sidelight to the uh, marketplace at that time. So precision optics was really kind of a mainstay for Tropel. And these are some of, the <clears throat> some of the optics that were used. You could see this was one of the first uh, step and repeat camera lenses used by the Bell system to make the masks that were used in one-to-one -one, uh, printing systems. This, this was used in a step and repeat camera to make the mask to go into the one-to-one -one printer. And that lens was really quite small. These, these lenses here are projection lenses that were used in the micrographics industry and uh, basically large-scale printing that would print uh, on paper about the size of this screen. These are other microelectronics lenses and uh, uh, for various applications. So this is about the time when uh, we, we really needed greater metrology as a component of manufacturing process for delivering higher and higher precision lenses, mostly for the microelectronics industry. And this uh, collaboration between Bell Laboratories and Tropel took place because Tropel really didn't have the wherewithal to build the lenses that go into the interferometers and make its, make, to make its uh, lithography system its lithography systems as well as its uh, metrology systems. So let me just go here. This is, this shows in essence the system that was one of the uh, first major projects I was working on at Bell Laboratories. This shows, these are uh, various aplanatic attachments that could go on this relay lens for, so that one could match the curvature of the lens that you want to test. And in this case, this is the, a particular test surface. This interferometer used a, for the time, this was a very, very important component to getting high accuracy in the area of uh, uh, the fringe analysis. Viticon cameras were very common at the time, but the stability and linearity of Viticon camera was really unacceptable compared to what you needed to get high accuracy, um, high accuracy out of the fringe system itself. <clears throat> so in, in the early 70s, Reticon Corporation came out with the first addressable diode array semiconductor device and this was 32 by 32 and it was extremely linear very high dynamic range and really what was quite critical for um, 
rigorous analysis in the, of the interferograms. And um, I'm sure this is all uh, obvious to most of you here, but here if we just take an interferogram that is seen by the cam digital camera system, if you looked at the intensity as you change the path length in the test arm or the reference arm, uh, you, you move that and you see that at each, at each point, and this is, just say, call it point A and point B, you would see the sinusoidal fringes at each one of those points displaced by a given phase. Whatever that phase is, is what you want to find out. So by going through that process where you're doing a Fourier series fit, you are able to determine what is this phase difference to really quite a high level of accuracy. And the more data you take, the more accurate that determination becomes. So this, set, this setup in this particular case shows, uh, in, in this slide, it shows the setup for testing an optical surface, which would be in this position here. And in this case, the same setup is used to test a lens, where this is a, basically a bench that supports the lens under test, which is here, and air bearing, air bearing table where you could float the system and look at the field of the lens uh, off axis and, and on, as well as on axis. And this was quite a stable system and useful in this case for testing the quality of the image at multiple field points for the step and repeat camera that was used to make the masks in the, uh, in the late 70s. And as you'll see, the size of these lenses started to grow really quite significantly. Oh, now this, um, this I just thought for the younger peop people in the audience, you might be interested. This was, this was a computer system that was used for this in the, in 1971. It was a 12-bit word, 8,000 word core memory, not um, not semiconductor memory. There was no semiconductor memory at this time. And the mass data storage was a rotating magnetic disk, in this case with 32,000 words. The price of this disk um, memory system was about 30 cents a word, which is a good deal more expensive than I think uh, uh, you all know that's available today. So this was all assembly language, paper tape input. You can see a teletype uh, interface here. And this computer cost of just the computer itself was 25K. So there was probably close to $50,000 worth of computer here, which is about at least 100,000 to a million times slower than what you have in your pocket. So Tropel industrialized this technology in the, in the 70s. They had a, a manual interferometer of this configuration. It was basically a Twyman green with a lot of convertible features. This was used, uh, uh, this, this basically was converted to a phase measuring interferometer by uh, putting in the camera at the, the right place and providing piezos for doing the phase shifting. Um, <clears throat> this is the time when uh, in the 80s where the uh, life got really interesting because Tropel made these interferometers for sale and all of the manufacturers that were in the microlithography business were uh, we're buying these interferometers. I, I, the accuracy and the reproducibility that they would get uh, were such that we had all of the suppliers of microlithography in the early 80s 
right up until the time that the company was bought by GCA, which was, GCA was a competitor. All of these other companies were their competitors. So they were, um, they were very nervous. And I, I recall uh, the last system that shipped, shipped to Nikon, and they had um, several people on site 24 hours a day to make sure that their system was, was finished and shipped. Uh, and GCA was very, very quick to get out of this business. This was the, this was the stepper system in 1978 that GCA made. This was the size, uh, you, the lens itself, you can actually see here. It's really quite small, about the size of a, of a large uh, Starbucks coffee. And this was the, uh, the stepper itself. These lenses um, have grown absolutely dramatically as a result of advances in lens design, as well as manufacturing technology is in addition. This was the, it, these are all to the same scale. This was that step and repeat lens that um, I showed on several other occasions, which is really you could hold in the palm of your hand. This was a real um, workhorse for GCA through the 80s and 90s. And here the numerical aperture kept getting larger and larger in this direction. The size of the lens in order to get that numerical aperture had to grow as well as the size of the chips. And so these things have scaled up to the point where this, uh, while this looks like a very complex lens, and, and it is, it, uh, it, was about, it was about this big. However, you can see here that at, this used an exposure wavelength in the blue, visible blue. This is eye line, which is uh, just below the visible perception. And uh, here this was at 248 nanometer, which is one of the lines of the Krypton fluoride laser. But this is about the place where GCA realized that um, the critical mass that you have to have in order to be successful in the microelectronics uh, fabrication business is such that there were very few people that could sustain this uh, level of investment. And uh, this is kind of a pictorial of the number of people that were involved in op making optical lithography in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And basically, it's, you can see most of the semiconductor companies themselves made their own lithographic equipment, which is, uh, as time went on, had become more and more a capital intensive business that took enormous resources in order to uh, remain in the business. So you can see that the, the players got whittled down smaller and smaller. And uh, this, this is actually when the, the last time I um, adjusted this overhead and uh, these are the only players left in the business. And fundamentally, the one with the largest market share right now, and really the only one that is likely to remain in this business except for very special applications, is ASML and Zeiss. Zeiss makes the lenses, and ASML does the rest of the exposure tool. And um, this shows. Zeiss has their own, um, this is a, an advertisement that shows the progress of Zeiss's lenses from 64 to 84. And this shows, this shows the latest, but this is 2005. So this is already at more than 10 years old. But this lens is uh, almost a ton. 
and it is quite big. I don't know what else to say. It speaks for itself. So that's kind of the lithography side of things. I also wanted to mention that Tropel was involved in benchtop metrology, and because they had their own single frequency laser, this was a product that was developed that was really quite, uh, <clears throat> quite a good seller for many years. And it, it, uh, so this was a very high coherence laser. It used um, uh, instantaneous phase measuring in interferometry and was sold, this product is still in, uh, in production now. I'm, it's, Pratt & Whitney was the last company that I remember was selling this. I'm not sure who's selling it now, but it's still, in, it's still available. Um, Tropel realized that it was, it, it had some skills in metrology and we migrated more and more away from metrology related to semiconductor and focused on high level metrology for the industrial marketplace. There are lots of applications where you need to know, such as with that laser ruler, where you need to know to uh, a micron or better the thickness of something or the geometry to these high levels. And uh, as a result of a product line that made very large prisms, these were prisms about uh, eight inch cubes that were used for a one-to-one -one exposure system made by the Ultratech Corporation. And uh, so they were, like many companies, they were building up inventory because they, the marketplace was moving very, very quickly. And then uh, at one of the valleys of the uh, semiconductor cycle, um, that whole product line disappeared. We had a whole inventory of large prisms and uh, a bunch of clever people that decided, well, let's, uh, maybe we can make something out of this. And this was uh, grazing incidence interferometry, which in essence gives you a, uh, the ability to look at a non-specular surface by looking at it at a, uh, at a grazing incidence angle. And uh, this gives you fringes with fringe spacing that is related to the, um, uh, the cosine or the cosine of the angle of the uh, angle of incidence. And so that we, there were quite a few products that were developed with this. This you can see from the hairdo that this was uh, quite, an old, um, quite an old picture. But this, this was used primarily for looking at the flatness of wafers, masks, uh, both um, blanks and polish, uh, polish blanks before coating with uh, chrome. And these, um, these are still in use in there. Uh, no computer was involved in the instrument at this, at this time, but it was expanded as a product line to many different uh, grazing incidence applications, such as wafers that were originally very small to bigger and bigger still, the flatness of hard disks, the flatness of, um, um, these are ceramic disks, I'm not sure what, they're, what they were for, but again, both photo masks um, and those that were coated with, with chrome. Uh, this shows what what the, uh, uh, what the display was like. And these also used phase measuring interferometry. And the modulation in this case was done by changing the angle of incidence ever so slightly. And uh, you, you get the fringe shifting and mapping the wafers in much the same way you see with other types of interferometers. And from this, was, uh, has evolved a whole bunch of different Flatmaster product lines. This was a, a Flatmaster 40 that was used for measuring metal parts in, uh, 
in lapping operations of uh, well, really many different many different applications. These this Flatmaster wafer was for again for wafers. This was the thing called a polish check, which looked at wafers during the polishing process that were mounted on big ceramic discs that are used to polish these wafers in uh, uh, huge laps like you see around this place. And, um, and then ap other applications where you're using cassettes with uh, multiple wafers. And uh, the, this, this and a number of these other tools were used on production lines for uh, the wafer manufacturing process. This was uh, one of the latest tools. This is used for, this is st still in production now. It's being used for making the masks that are used for um, uh, substrates for both high resolution uh, deep UV lithography as well as uh, the masks for uh, EUV lithography. And this shows uh, another process where here we're looking at the flatness of masks in various stages of the process used for printing the patterns on LCD um, <clears throat> display glass. So this is 1.4 by 1.2 meters and uh, about a centimeter thick. So this is quite a large tool that uh, was used for making substrates really very large. We also had uh, took the grazing incidence metrology into uh, cylindrical form and this this was a product where we basically took a, a laser source, collimated it, and we have a, a circular grating here, another circular grating here. So the first order diffraction from that grating would uh, bounce off the cylindrical part and be straightened out by here and interfere with the zero order. And on your image plane, you would see circular fringes that look quite different than what you normally see. And then this, uh, this, is the, what you, this is what you would see if you unwrapped the, uh, uh, the fringe pattern. If you put it back in as a surface relief map for the cylinder itself, this shows you that in 3D. And Finally, there was uh, another form of cylindrical metrology that also used instantaneous um, PMI to look at diesel fuel injectors, which to my knowledge is about one of the most uh, precise metal parts that are used in high volume today. These, this is, uh, this is about an eighth of an inch in diameter here. And this, this is the lower end where the diesel nozzles come out. And there's a piston that goes through here with a point on the end that basically compresses the fuel and injects it into the diesel cylinder. And all of this precision is required because the emission standards are such that in order to control the emissions, Diesel engines, particularly for trucks, use up to five different injections per cycle in every cylinder. And the tolerance is here to avoid injecting fuel at the wrong time and the wrong place in the cycle uh, really contributes to pollution. So these, these are, the clearance is about, um, 30 to 40 nanometers at here and the precision here is such that this was a very complex instrument. Uh, we made about a dozen of these and uh, 
it never really paid for itself, but it solved a lot of problems in the uh, in the manufacturing processes for those companies involved in um, making diesel fuel injectors. You can see here these are the these are the the nozzles holes at the end of that little tip, and um, so I would say it was a it was a really interesting science project, but it never really paid for itself. Sometimes that happens. Um, we've been moving away from grazing incidents in interferometry and, in essence, moving to frequency scanning interferometry, which gives you kind of a, uh, an analogous way of using an effectively longer wavelength to um, do the same thing that you would like to do with a grazing incidence interferometer. And in this case, um, instead of varying the uh, uh, modulating the fringes by changing the path length, you can do an equivalent thing by changing the frequency of two different lasers. And uh, to be a little clearer on that, with a tunable laser source, both the diode cavity and the external cavity have modes. And by carefully controlling and changing the, both the external and the internal cavity, you can do frequency modulation and do the equivalent of grazing incidence interferometry, but at normal incidence. And uh, here's, well, let me go to this one first. This is an example of a, <coughs> of a metrology need where you want to verify both flatness and spacing of planar parts at normal incidence. This would be a very difficult thing to do with grazing incidence interferometry because and in this case, it's done all from, all at normal incidence. And this is a, a, uh, a, a variety of parts that are used for, or optimized for different diameters. In this case, 40 millimeter diameter, 150 and 300 millimeters. So, kind of all of this, intro is to bring to light the fact that we live in an incredibly different world today from a metrology perspective. And if you look at the uh, computer that was used in the 70s, compare that with where we are today. Laser sources, computation, and software are in essence free and readily available. Um, and a lot of the innovations that are taking place are in really the integration of systems and subsystems. And we have a tremendous uh, selection in terms of subsystems and parts that you can buy off the shelf. But that comes with um, much greater time constraints. Customers are so much more impatient. They want it now and they want it at much lower cost, and uh, they want it customized. So these are all things that were very, very difficult to do 25 years ago, 30 years ago, but <clears throat> with the advent of the ability to integrate photonics as well as electronics, there's uh, really great opportunities ahead. So I wanted to brag about some stuff that you guys are doing here that uh, is, a, is a great illustration of the different uh, world that we live in. Here we have uh, an iPhone that's mounted on a 3D printed mount. And this is, this is the source. It's the detector. And the source and the software this is all integrated here, and this is 500 bucks, and it's, you, you can buy it today. Uh, but there's a lot of creativity in putting this together 
to um, solve a problem. And in this case, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is used for measuring the deformable laps, or um, it has that capability. I think the, uh, this, oh, and uh, instead of phase shifting, you can color code the phase shifting, in essence, by multiplexing color. And um, if this works, well, Yeah, here we are. How about it? You guys know how this works. In any event, it's uh, not important to show that show that difference. But let me just say that. Um, I want to show you one other example of how things have changed and how they've been enabled by optics. Yeah, this is this is some work at uh, Caltech that's been going on for quite some period of time. And here they're looking at the what they believe is the center of the Milky Way galaxy, which has, which incorporates the black hole holding it all together. And this, you can see, this is a six arc second field of view. Here is a zoom in on here. This is one arc second. This is the adaptive optics off. This is with the adaptive, adaptive optics on. And now, if we look at this same area, this is 15 years of data, time lapse, showing from 1995 to 2012, I think, 2015, 2010. Um, here's where they believe the black hole is. And they've calculated all of these orbits and speeds over this 15-year period of time. And uh, you could never do this with a PDP-8 computer. <laughs> in any event, this is a very, very exciting time that we live in. Uh, I feel very lucky to have been alive during the period of time to see such incredible change. I think the r real challenge for all of you here is What's it going to be like in another 25 years? Uh, optics is awesome because you can see. There's so much that you can see. And the ability to integrate and span all these different technologies is, uh, is very inspiring. And I uh, wish I could be alive to see what the talk would be another 25 or 50 years from now. In any event, uh, I feel blessed to have been able to have so much fun in my career and uh, the, uh, pleased to be able to share it with you. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for questions, Colton. Uh, 